Hi everyone, welcome to the first lesson of Chemistry 101. This is lesson 1.1, and I'm starting us out here in the chapter one lecture note outline packet that you can find on Canvas. I'm on page one of that packet. So if you don't already have that printed, go back to Canvas, print it out, and then you'll be ready to go. Let's get started. So here in chapter one, we're gonna first start out by talking about measurements and how we handle measurements. And of course, as I mentioned in the introductory video, chemistry is an experimental science. That means it's driven by experiments. And fundamentally, most experiments have to involve some form of measurement. And that's why we're gonna be talking about this first in our chemistry class. Now, as far as measurements go, the first thing we're gonna be talking about is uncertainty in measurement. That's here in part one of this lecture note outline packet. It turns out that in scientific work, we distinguish between two types of numbers. Those numbers can be exact or those that are inexact. The reason why we have to distinguish between these two types of numbers is that exact numbers have a degree of certainty that inexact numbers do not. And as a result of this, the conclusions that can be drawn from exact numbers are very different from those that can be drawn from inexact numbers. So the first thing that I want you to learn about is how to distinguish between exact numbers and inexact numbers. So let's first look at the characteristics of exact numbers versus inexact numbers, and then talk about some examples of each. Exact numbers are numbers that have values that are known without any uncertainty. Another way of saying that is that they are certainly known. They are definitely one number and not any other number. Examples of values like this would be the integer digits that you know. Numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Those numbers are exactly those numbers. There's no uncertainty that the number 1 is sometimes 1, or maybe sometimes it's a little bit more or less than 1. No, it's 1, and it's always 1. Inexact numbers, of course, are not like this. They have values that are not defined as a specific number and have some uncertainty in them. They're uncertain or approximate, and therefore we call those inexact numbers. Other types of exact numbers include values that are based on a definition. We call these defined values. A lot of the time we have a special word for these types of numbers. Words like dozen or pair or score. Those are examples of words that are defined as a specific known value, and we consider those to be exact numbers. On the other hand, when a measurement is required to establish a value, that value is inexact. Whenever a measurement is taken, there's fundamentally some type of error that's associated with the measurement, and this leads to inexact numbers. So all measurements produce values that are inexact. Now, a third category of exact numbers that I want you to be able to recognize are those that have values that can be obtained just by counting objects. Now, you might say that counting objects is a type of measurement and therefore should lead to some kind of error and therefore produce inexact numbers. However, we assume that counting objects can be done in such a way as to eliminate all error. Whether or not that's true is definitely a debatable topic. However, we're gonna consider values that can be obtained by counting objects to produce exact numbers. So we'll assume that. So an example of this would be, say, the number of eggs in a box, or the number of slices of bread in a package, or if we were looking at, say, a surface scan of a metal down at the atomic level, the number of atoms that we can count in a given region of space. Now, any value that requires some kind of an estimation fundamentally is an inexact number because there must be some kind of error assumed when making that estimation. So we're going to consider values that require that estimation to be inexact numbers. All right, so let's move down to the next section. And what I want you to do is pause the video and see if you can write down whether or not you think that the value obtained from the example provided would give an exact or an inexact value. And when you unpause the video, I'll go through a few of these and we can discuss them. Now, the first one here, mass of a paperclip, is an inexact number. And that's because to obtain the mass of a paperclip, we have to perform a measurement. And anytime we perform a measurement, as I said earlier, we produce a, some kind of an error. So we get an inexact value. What about the number of paper clips in a box? Well, that's correct. It would be an exact number because we can count the number of paper clips in that box. Now, what about the mass of the whole box of paper clips? Well, that's right. That would be an inexact number because we have to measure it. 
Now here's maybe a little bit of a tricky one. What about the mathematical value pi? We know that nobody can write down all of the digits for pi, so that makes it seem like any value of pi that we write down is estimated in some way, but it's also important to remember that pi is a defined value. Because pi is a defined value, that makes it an exact value. What is the definition of pi? Well, pi is defined as the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. And while we might write down estimations of pi on paper when we're writing down something like 3.14, if we use the symbol pi, we mean this exact ratio. Now, if you look at the next set of examples, you'll notice they all have one thing in common. The number of centimeters in one inch, or the number of inches in a mile, the number of microseconds in a week, or the number of pages in a book. You'll notice they're all exact values. That's because the first group of these are defined values, and then the last one, the number of pages in a book, is a countable number. So these are all exact. Now what about the mass of a page in a book? Well, again, that's something we would have to measure, so it's inexact. And likewise, the mass of the entire book has to be also measured, so that makes that an inexact number. So something I want you to think about at this stage is why are values based on measurements inherently uncertain or inexact? Where does this uncertainty actually come from? I mentioned earlier that all measurements involve some form of error. Try to think of some examples of errors that might be introduced when you're using something like a ruler or a balance, for example. When you're thinking about errors in this way, it's helpful to organize them into different categories. Sometimes errors are introduced by the person actually taking the measurement. Sometimes errors are introduced by the actual method under which the measurement is taken. And another category of errors are those that are introduced by the instrument themselves, the thing that you're using to actually take the measurement. Try to think of an example of error in each case. To help you along, I'll give you an example for each one of these myself. So for example, errors by a person, so-called operator errors. This can be something as simple as the person doing the measurement actually spills some of the actual sample being measured. Or say they're looking at a ruler from a different perspective than is used by a different operator. Now, the second category of error that I've listed here, I called method errors. They're also known as systematic errors. And in these types of errors, the measurement is taken and an error is produced usually in one direction or another. This can be something like when you're taking someone's blood pressure. If for some reason when you're taking that blood pressure, it changes the blood pressure, always going up or always going down. Say it makes the person feel nervous in some way, their blood pressure goes up, and therefore we're having some method error introduced or a systematic error introduced each time the measurement is taken. Now the third category that I've listed here, I called instrument errors. Instrument errors are ways that the instrument is being used incorrectly. These can be things like calibration errors or in the way that the instrument is actually decomposing over time or degrading over time. So for example, with a balance, an electronic balance, um, a known type of error in these instruments is over time, their calibration drifts as a result of the circuitry slowly changing over time. This is called an instrument error. Okay, so now that we've reached the end of page one, let's go to the next page and start talking about another aspect of measurements, that being precision and accuracy. So now that we know that measurements all have some kind of error associated with them, let's go in and more clearly define that error. And the two words that we use to distinguish the types of error that we have in measurements are the terms precision and accuracy. To understand what these two words mean and the difference between them, let's look at a visual analogy that I have here with an example of darts on a dartboard. So if you've ever played the game of darts, or if, even if you haven't, it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, a person throws darts at a board with the intent on getting as close as possible to the red circle in the middle that is called the bullseye. Now, the closer that the dart hits that bullseye, you know, the higher the score the person gets for that particular dart throw. But they have more than one dart to throw. Typically, a round consists of a person throwing three darts in a row, and a score is, is, is produced after those three darts are thrown. Now, to help you try to understand what the word precision means versus the word accurate, I'm going to actually go through each of these example rounds of darts and say whether or not it's precise, accurate, both or neither, for example, 
And then we're going to try to figure out how we can write out a definition for the word precision and a definition for the word accuracy based on what I show you here. So in this first round of darts, we see all three darts have hit the bullseye. That's the target of the game. That's the goal of the game is to actually hit that circle. So it turns out this one is both precise and accurate. We get both of them out of this round of darts. Now let's look at the second round. In the second round, notice that the three darts have all hit in the same place, but they are a distance away from that bullseye. So yeah, they're all in the same place out here, but it's not quite where the person really wanted to hit. They wanted to hit in the bullseye, that's the target. So it turns out if we use the words accuracy and precision correctly here, this round would be called precise, but it would not be called accurate. It is inaccurate, but it is precise. So think about that when we go down later to define what the word accuracy and precision actually means. Now, before we do that, let's go to this third round of darts. In this third round of darts, notice that none of the actual darts have hit the bullseye. And another feature of this is that all of the darts are far away from each other. So not only have the darts not hit the bullseye, but they are not close together either. This is neither accurate, nor is it precise. So let's start first with accuracy. Looking at this game of darts, which one is accurate and which ones are not accurate? And what makes them accurate? Well, that's right, the first one is accurate because the darts themselves are close to the target. So if the darts are close to the target, that makes it accurate. So what does it mean to have something in general accurate? Well, it means we're close to some defined value. Now, in chemistry, we're going to be talking about data, value that we obtain from measurements or defined values. And we're going to say that a measurement is accurate when it is close to that generally agreed upon standard or value that we have predetermined ahead of time to be the correct value or the target. An example of this might be encountered in the lab. For example, we might know ahead of time the density of a particular liquid. And then we have the students go measure the actual density and see what their values produce. And then we can calculate the difference between those two things. So for example, say a student measured the density of a liquid to be 1.14. And then they did another one that was 1.15 and then another one that was 1.14. But we know ahead of time that that liquid has a density of 1.00. It turns out that the measurements the student got are inaccurate because they are a distance away from the actual known value. Now, I'll show you in a little bit how you can sort of distinguish between what's close and what's far away. That's a little bit more information required to do that. But the main point here is that if a measurement is close to an agreed upon standard or target, we say it's accurate. If it's far away from it or not close, we say that it is not accurate. And the closer a measurement is to that standard, the more accurate it becomes. That's an important point. So for example, say I threw another dart at this board and it landed here in the white space. And then another one that landed, say here in the white space, and then another one out here that landed in the blue space. We would say that the one closest to the red dot is the most accurate, followed by the one in the white space, which is in the middle, followed by that last green dot in that blue space, that would be the least accurate. So the closer something is to the agreed upon standard, the more accurate that measurement. So now that we've covered accuracy, let's talk about the other word, precision. Now let's look at these games of darts one more time and look at what's different between the precise games and the imprecise games, the ones that don't have precision. What do you notice that's different about them? Well, notice that the ones that are precise have darts that are all close together. They're grouped up. That means the person throwing the dart consistently hits the same type of spot or the same place. Now, it might not be an accurate spot. It might not be what they were actually aiming for, but they're throwing it consistently and getting the same type of measurement each time if we're talking about measurements. Now, the one that's imprecise has the darts far away. They're scattered, almost randomly dispersed from each other. That's the imprecise one. So if we're going to define precision in terms of measurements, what does it actually mean? Precision in terms of measurement means that the different measurements that are taken when multiple measurements are taken are close together. So they're consistent repeated measurements. That's the easiest way of saying it. Now let's go to the next page and look at a specific example comparing precision and accuracy with an actual measurement that we can look at. 
In this example, we have two different tape measures or rulers that are measuring the same bolt. Now, I took this example off of a web page that was talking about aerospace engineering. And it turns out, as you might expect, that when someone's building an airplane, they want to make sure they're using parts that have very well-defined accuracies and precisions. And it turns out we can use this bolt that we have here uh, as a way to compare the actual tape measures, tape measure A and tape measure B, to discuss their differences in terms of accuracy and precision. And what we're actually doing here is using the bolt as our measuring device because it turns out it is actually engineered better than either tape measure A or tape measure B. So it turns out this bolt is actually a one inch bolt. It's a standard one inch used in aerospace engineering. So considering that that bolt is defined as one inch, let's actually look at tape measure A and tape measure B and see if we can determine which of these tape measures is more accurate first and then more precise after that. So I want you to pause the video and I want you to look very carefully at tape measure A and tape measure B Assuming that that bolt is defined as one inch, which one of these rulers is more accurately measuring one inch? Now, to do this really carefully, you can trace a line from the edge of the bolt down to each of the rulers, and you can compare where that line lands to see which one of these rulers is actually closer to the one inch line on that bolt. And whichever one's closer is definitely the more accurate tape measure to be using. So which one looks closer to you here, tape measure A or tape measure B? And if you said tape measure B, great job, that's correct. Tape measure B is giving the value for this measurement of the bolt closer to one inch, therefore making it closer to the target that we're looking for. So we would say that tape measure B is more accurate. Now to answer the question of which tape measure is more precise is a little bit more difficult at this stage because there's one more piece of information that we need beyond the definition of precision to be really clear about this. But I'm going to try my best to explain it anyway. Um, first off, we know precision is about how close measurements are together when subsequent me measurements are taken. Now if you look at these two rulers, which one is able to produce measurements that are closer together? each time a measurement is taken. Now, if you say tape me measure A, that's correct. And that's because the divisions on tape measure A are closer together. Each time we use it, we can get actual values out of it. Even if they're not accurate, those values are closer together because the divisions are closer together. Tape measure B has wider divisions and therefore repeated measurements have to be farther apart by definition because of the type of measurement we're using. So when we say which tape measure is more precise, we would say tape measure A because the divisions are closer together. Now just a few more things to think about before we move on. First, can the accuracy of every measurement always be known? Why or why not? Similarly, can the precision of every measurement always be known? Why or why not? To answer this first question about accuracy and whether or not it can always be known, think about this. What's required to establish if something, say a measurement, is accurate or not? Well, it requires that a standard is known ahead of time. Do we always know ahead of time what a measurement should be? Well, definitely not. One of the defining features of scientific research is the knowledge that there is much more that is unknown than is already known. And that means many times when we're taking a new measurement of something that's unknown, uh, we don't have anything to base it on. So I would say here, no, it is not always possible to say whether or not a measurement is accurate or not. Now, what about precision? Can we always know or establish the precision of a given measurement? Well, to answer that, we have to understand what's required to establish precision. What is required to establish precision? Well, multiple measurements. So if we can always take multiple measurements of something, then yeah, of course we could establish the precision. But is that always possible? No, definitely not. So for example, new elements are observed very frequently, and the first time they're observed, it's not actually known whether or not they'll ever observe it again. And if it can't be observed again, there's no way to establish the precision of any measurements that they take about that newly observed element or particle. So I would say here, can the precision of every measurement always be known? No, because it's not always possible to repeat measurements. So far, we've been talking about accuracy and precision in very high-level terms, kind of philosophically. 
Now what we're going to do is talk about how do we actually take that into account, this accuracy and precision and error in the numbers that we actually write down. And this is all about something that we call significant figures. Now you've probably heard about significant figures before, if not actually used them. But in case you haven't, that's okay. We're going to start here assuming you know nothing about significant figures. And that's actually going to be helpful. I'd like you to put aside anything that you think you know about significant figures. And let's just start here from ground zero. Now, what we're going to do first here in part A is learn about the rules of significant figures. And what I mean by that is there are a number of rules that we can apply when we're looking at a number that's written down to determine how many of the digits in that number are what we call significant. Now, what does it mean for a number to be significant? Well, we're going to talk about sort of next time and well throughout the course. But for now, I just want you to be able to look at a number and say, hey, that has, say, two significant figures, or this one has three or four. And to do that, I have to teach you about the rules of significant figures. And that's shown here in the table that I've outlined below. Now, you'll notice in this table, I've listed out the types of digits that we're going to encounter. And this is all the types of digits that we could ever encounter in a number. We're going to look at those four different categories of digits and we're going to see whether or not, based on the type of digit it is, whether or not that digit is significant. Then I have a column with examples. And we're going to apply that rule to these examples and write down the number of significant figures in the number. So as we go through this table, I'm going to explain these to you, do an example, and you might want to pause occasionally and see if, before I write it down, if you can figure out how to apply the rule to the examples in that column. So let's get started here with types of digits called non-zero digits. What do I mean by types of digits that are non-zeros? Well, when we look at a number, the number is either going to have a value that's zero or is not zero. And what I'm talking about here is digits that are not zeros, okay? Some examples of that would be four, five, and seven, or two and five, or any digit here that isn't a zero. Well, are non-zero digits significant or are they not significant? Well, it turns out this is a nice, easy rule. It turns out that non-zero digits are always significant. So whenever you look at a number, if you see a digit that's not a zero, that digit is significant. So let's see if we can write down how many significant digits there are in these examples, 4, 5, 7, and 2.5. Do you see that there are three non-zero digits in 4, 5, 7? Well, that means they're all significant, so three. What about 2.5? Well, that's correct, there are two significant figures in 2.5 because they're both non-zeros. So that covers digits that are not zeros, but what about digits that are zeros? Well, it turns out that zeros are a little bit more complicated than non-zeros. In fact, there are three types of zero digits that we're going to have to differentiate between to determine whether or not that zero is significant or not. Let's start with this first one. These are called zeros between non-zeros. Okay, so these are zeros in the middle of a number that are surrounded by non-zero digits. And it turns out these types of zeros are always significant also. So for example, if we had 1001, those two zeros in the middle there are between non-zeros and that makes them significant. So how many total significant figures do we have in 1001? Well, if you said four, that's correct. The ones are both significant because, of course, they're non-zeros, and the zeros between them are also significant because they are zeros between non-zeros, which are always significant. So we have four significant figures in 1001. What about 103? Well, if you said three, that's correct. The one and the three are non-zeros, and of course, that makes them significant. The zero is between the one and the three, so that's also significant, and therefore, we have three significant figures. Let's talk about zeros that are at the beginning of a number. These zeros aren't between numbers, they actually are in front, and they serve as placeholders. They tell us whether or not a number is very small or very large, depending on how many there are. It turns out because they are just placeholders, they're not actually involved in the specific quantity of the measurement, the actual measurement itself, uh, they are never significant. Now, this one is often forgotten by students. They typically have uh, for some reason, they want to count these as significant digits, but I want to remind you that these zeros at the beginning of a number are never, ever significant. So if they're not significant, how many significant figures do we have in this first example? Well, that's correct. We only have one, the number two. 
The number two is significant because it's a non-zero digit, but the rest of those zeros are insignificant. They're just placeholders. Okay, what about this second example with the 0.00026? That we have two significant figures because we only have two non-zero digits and there are no other significant zeros in that number. Now we get to the third example. How many significant figures do we have in 0.000206? Well, that's correct. We have three. That's because we have one significant zero. That's the one between the two and the six. That's significant because it's between non-zeros. The other zeros are insignificant. They're just placeholders. So we have three significant figures there. And that brings us to our last type of zero. These are zeros that are at the end of a number. Now, this one might be the most complicated for you to look at. It takes the most time, usually, for people to figure this one out because it turns out these types of zeros have criteria associated with them. Sometimes these zeros at the end of a number are significant, and other times they aren't. What makes them significant or not? Well, it turns out if you see zeros at the end of a number, they're only significant when there's a decimal point present somewhere on the line. If there isn't a decimal point present, those zeros are also insignificant. So let's look at this first example, the number 2000. We have two and three zeros, and their zeros there are at the end of a number. They're after a non-zero. Notice there are no decimal points present. So are those zeros significant? No. It turns out we only have one significant figure in the number 2000, the two. What about if we put a decimal point at the end of the line? Well, that makes that number have four significant figures because the zeros are significant when there's a decimal point present. Those zeros are after a non-zero, and that requires a decimal point for them to be uh, significant. Okay, what about the third example here? We have 2000.0. This one, like the one above it, has all significant zeros. Just because that zero is after the decimal point doesn't change it. It's significant because there is a decimal point present on the line. Okay, let's look at the last two examples in this box. How many significant digits does 0 0.002060 have? If you said four, that's correct. The leading zeros up in the front are insignificant. Okay, now a lot of people confuse that. They think those zeros are significant because I said if a decimal point is present, it makes zeros significant. That's not what I said. Ze those are zeros at the beginning of a number. And zeros at the beginning of a number are never significant, regardless or not of if there's a decimal point present. Now, we have to look at the other two zeros there, the zeros after the two and the zero after the six. Those are zeros at the end of a number. Those are the ones that will change their significance whether or not a decimal point is present. There is a decimal point present, so that makes those zeros significant, and we have four significant figures in that number. Now, with that information in hand, try out this last example. Notice that we have three zeros up in the front. Those are zeros at the beginning of a number, and they're never significant, regardless of there being a decimal point present there. Now, the numbers after that, the two, the zero, the six, and the other two zeros, those are all significant because there's a decimal point present, there are non-zero digits, and there are zeros that are after non-zero digits or between them. So we have a total of five significant figures in that last value. Okay, now that we've gone through those examples about zeros and non-zeros, see if you can come up with the correct number of significant figures for each of the values that I've listed here in the table below. Pause the video, write down the significant figures. When you unpause it, I'll show you the answers. So in this first example, we have four significant figures. The non-zero digits, three, four, two, one, are all significant, but that zero is not because it's in the front of the number. In 101.92, we have a total of five significant figures. The zero in the middle of the ones, that's significant because it's a zero between non-zeros. For 560, we have two significant figures, the five and the six. That zero is insignificant because there's no decimal point present and it's a zero at the end of a number. What about 0, 0.070? We have the seven, that's significant, and the last zero there, the zero after the seven is significant also. Why is it significant? Well, it's a zero at the end of a number and there is a decimal point present, but those leading zeros are insignificant. 
so that we have two significant figures in this number. Now, what about 90100? Zero, zero, zero? For that, we have three significant figures, the 9, the 0, and the 1. The last two zeros are insignificant. Why? There's no decimal point present. What about 0 0.2? Well, that only has one significant figure because the 0 at the beginning of the number doesn't count. Those are never significant. So congratulations if you got those correct. You're doing great so far. Let's go to the next page where we're going to learn one more aspect with regards to significant figures, and that has to do with calculations and rounding. Now, because we often have to use measurements to conduct calculations in order to arrive at different conclusions, we often have to deal with numbers that require rounding. And while I'm sure you're totally familiar with rounding from other arithmetic classes or just regular life, I think it's really important for us to go through the specific steps of rounding, specifically here in chemistry when we're dealing with significant figures. So let's talk about how we do rounding when we're dealing with significant figures. So this usually happens when you take a measurement and maybe another measurement, and then you maybe multiply or divide them together. And you get some number with a lot of digits in it. Say, for example, this one I have here, which says 1.576, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And for some reason, which you will see soon what that reason is, you need to, uh, we need to shrink it to the right number of significant figures. You need to change it. And that is fundamentally rounding. So um, I will explain to you how you know how many digits to round it to later. But for now, let's see how we actually do the rounding. And let's say we wanted to round this number to four significant figures. So how you want to do this is first start at the left-hand side of the number. That's where the magnitude of numbers are the greatest in value. So over here at the one, that's our greatest value digit here. And we're going to go from left to right, and we're going to underline the first four significant figures. These are the digits that we want to keep in our rounded value at the end. Now, just some terminology here. The one is called the greatest significant figure because it's the greatest in numerical value. The six is very important here. It's called the least significant figure. We're going to use that term quite a bit. So let's write it down. And I want to draw an arrow to that six because that's where we're really focusing our attention. That's the least significant figure. Now, when we round our value here, this calculated value with all of the extra digits, we're either going to increase that six by rounding it up, or we're going to keep it the same by rounding down. So how do we make that decision? Well, what we do is we look specifically to the digit that's adjacent to the six, the least significant figure. If that digit, the one that's adjacent to the least significant figure, is five or greater, we round the least significant digit up. We're rounding up in that case. However, if that digit is four or below, we round off all of those digits, keeping the least significant figure the same. So what do we do in this case? Because the seven is five or greater, we are rounding up here. So that means that our least significant digit gets rounded up to a seven, and the number that we get in the end with four significant figures is 1.577. Now, what if instead of having a 7 in that place, we had, say, a 3? What would the number become? Well, that's correct. It would just be 1.576. Now, before we move on, let's try a few examples of this with different types of values and see if we can round them to the correct number of significant figures. Let's start here with the first value I've shown on the left in this table. I have a calculated value of 6.750, and I, for some reason, need to round it to one significant figure. What would the number become? Pause the video and see if you can determine that. Now, because I only want one significant figure, that means I want to keep the 6 and round everything else off. So what I have to do is look to the digit next to that least significant figure, the 6, and say, do I round up or round down? I see a 7 there. That means I'm rounding up, and our rounded value becomes 7. Now, what if I had something like 16.130, and I needed to round that to three significant figures? What would the number become? Well, that means we need to keep the 1, the 6, and the next 1. And we're looking next to that 1, that's our least significant digit, and we're looking at that value and saying, is it 5 or above, or is it 4 and below? Well, the number 3 is below 5, so that means we're rounding down. What does the number become? 
That's right, it becomes 16.1. That has three significant figures in it. Now let's look at two different ways of rounding the number 109. Let's say we needed to round 109 to two significant figures. What would it become? So for this, we need to be pretty careful. We're gonna be looking at the one and the zero place. Those are the two places where I want to have significant figures after everything is done. We need to look then next to the zero. That zero is our least significant digit. We need to look next to it at the nine and say, are we rounding up or are we rounding down? So if you said up, that's correct. We're rounding up because nine, of course, is five or greater. So what does this number become when we round it to two significant figures? Well, that's correct. It becomes a 110. Now, what about this case where we have the same number, 109, but we round, want to round it to one significant figure? So in that case, we look at the one, the first digit there, and we're looking next to it. The one is our least significant place, right? So we're looking next to it at the zero, and we're saying, okay, do we round up or down based on that zero being there? Now, if you see that we're rounding down, that's correct. We're rounding down because the zero is below five, so this becomes the number 100, which has one significant figure in it. Let's try this last example. I want you to pause the video and take some time with this one to make sure you get the right rounded value. So because we want to have two significant figures in the result, that means we have to look at the first two digits here and we have to make those significant. We also have to look next to that second or least significant digit where the zero is and consider whether we're rounding up or we're rounding down. Now five, of course, is five or greater. So we're rounding up in this case. That means we have to round that zero digit up a value. So we get one, one, zero, 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 zero. And that has two significant figures in it. So if you got those right, great job. Now we're gonna move on to part four, which is the last part of today's lesson. And we're gonna be talking here about scientific notation. The values that we will handle in chemistry will range from very, very large to very small. And because of that, we often have to use a lot of placeholder digits or zeros that are insignificant. And one way to make this a little more convenient for us is to utilize something that's called scientific notation. What scientific notation is, is basically a way of taking away the insignificant placeholder zeros and instead of writing them out, turning them into powers of 10. Those powers of 10 can be positive or negative, whether or not we need to express a very large number or a very small number. So for example, if we have the number 300, 300 has two insignificant zeros, and if we wanted to write this in scientific notation, we could write those zeros as a power of 10. Because there are two places in, or in the 100th place, we can say three times 10 to the second power is the same as 300. What we've done is we've kept the one digit that is significant, the zero, and then we've expressed all those insignificant zeros as a power of 10, the second power of 10. What if we had 55,000? How do we do that? Well, we have three insignificant zeros and we also have the five. That five is in the thousandths place. So if we wanted to write this out as a number with two significant figures, but all of the zeros written out as a power of 10, we would write 5.5 times 10 to the fourth power. This still has two significant figures, and all of the zeros, all the place values for those zeros, are expressed as the fourth power of 10. Note something very important here. When we're writing out a number in scientific notation, it's very, very important that we write that number between 1 and 10 as a power of 10 of that number. So we don't write 55 times 10 to say the third power, we write 5.5 times 10 to the fourth power. We always wanna keep our significant digits between one and 10 for scientific notation. Let's go to the next page and look at a few examples. So here's a good example of a number that has a lot of leading zeros that are just kind of hard to see. It's very difficult to write down. It takes a lot of work to deal with it. So this is a good candidate for handling in scientific notation. So how do we do this? Well, we need to take all of those placeholder zeros in the front and make them a power of 10. Now, this is a number that is smaller than one, which means we're gonna have a negative power of 10 to express it. So that means we're gonna move that decimal place over a number of digits. 
And you'll notice you have to move it six spaces. Why six spaces? Well, that's because we have to move that decimal place next to the one, because if we moved it next to the zero or seven spaces, that would make our resulting value not between one and 10. Remember for scientific notation, everything we write down for those significant digits needs to be between one and 10. So we're gonna move the decimal place six spaces from the left to the right. This gives us with four significant digits, 1.023 times 10 to the negative sixth power. In doing this, we've expressed our value with four significant figures and in scientific notation. So that's going to conclude today's lesson. Next time, what we're gonna do is look at how calculations are handled with measurements that contain some number of significant figures. So you will learn how to use significant figures when you're doing calculations with multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction, and always be able to express your answers with the correct accuracy and precision. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson and I will see you soon.